Good morning. How's everyone hanging in there for the final day of Cannabis Conference 2022? <laughs> Welcome to today's Technologies and Solutions session, Vertical Farming, What to Know Before You Grow Up. In this session, expert, experts from PIP Horticulture, that's P-I-P-P, as well as Vertical Air Solutions will outline the importance, the important considerations behind space planning and design for a multi-tier indoor cultivation facility. Uh, before we get started, the usual housekeeping rules here, remember to silence your cell phones if you haven't already, and we're gonna try to save about 15 minutes at the end for a, a Q&A session. I'll come around and hand around the mic during that time. Okay, uh, on stage here we have Michael Williamson, Director of Cultivation uh, at PIP. Uh, we have James Cunningham, co-founder and director of cultivation at Vertical Air Solutions, and Del Rockwell, product manager at PIP. Um, with that, please give a, a warm welcome to these guys, and uh, we'll get the show underway. All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for attending. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is there's a lot of right ways to grow cannabis. There's a lot of wrong ways to do it, as I'm sure a lot of people in the room have experienced over the years. Um, but there's a lot of nuanced detail with vertical farming that's quite a bit different than how cannabis has been traditionally cultivated for the last, you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, let's see. Here we are. We'll skip through some of that. So, yeah, today we're going to jump into space planning and design layout first. We're really going to look at all the important factors. There's some key critical pillars that if you don't address them from day one, you're most likely gonna have some challenges. So we're gonna dive into those. And of course, with everything in cannabis, it's all about the little details. Um, we're also gonna talk about the critical importance of environmental control and how that really sets a tone for what you're capable of producing out of your system. And then we'll even jump into genetics for a little bit and we'll go over some ergonomics and labor saving techniques in your facility and ensuring that you keep people safe. So typically, we're seeing a lot of different trends in the cannabis industry, uh, specifically around vertical farming. We've seen a big shift specifically um, in the bedrooms. And when I refer to bedrooms, I'll say anything that's non-flowering. So that includes mother, clones, um, and vegetative plants. Now, everybody's been double stacking or triple stacking multi-tiered environments for their clone room forever. We're now seeing a pretty good size shift of people moving away from really large mothers um, and moving into a two-tiered environment for mothers. And there's some advantages to doing this. Um, plants are a lot like people. The longer they're alive, the longer they're susceptible to issues and challenges in terms of pests and disease. So traditionally where we as cultivators would grow really large moms and try and get as many cuttings as we could, you know, maybe upwards to six months or longer, we're now seeing that people are cycling through their mother stock plants a lot faster, you know, I'd say the typical lifespan can be somewhere in the three month range. Um, and by double stacking the mothers, traditionally if you had a very large mom and you took cuttings off of it, you're taking cuttings off the top and the sides, the interior of the mother isn't getting a lot of light, so those clones are generally, or those cuttings are a lot weaker, or their structure isn't quite ideal. Um, and so you're really kind of giving it a haircut, so to speak, around it. Now when you go from single tier to double tier, you're now getting twice the amount of healthy viable clones that are at the top of your plant or on the sides of your plant. And so people are able to get not only healthier plants, healthier cuttings, and also reduce the risk for um, pests and disease. So I'd say your typical mother room in a multi-tiered environment is generally around two tiers. I don't think we've seen too much more than that. Um, occasionally they'll stagger their mothers because they're going to be cycling them out. So you may have smaller mothers down below or above that they'll then you become the replacement future moms. Um, our typical bedrooms that we see in this space are pretty much officially around about three tiers. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Typical racking height that we see is commonly around 12 to 14 feet. Um, Del, can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, how high you can go in vertical farming from an engineering standpoint and yeah. how long? Absolutely. Um, most, at least I'll start with the length, most of the time we can go up to about 56 feet um, there's going to be some limitations, and we'll touch on it a little bit later as well, to the ergonomics and the efficiencies in those lengths. It's really tempting to always go as high as possible and as long as possible, but there are going to be some downsides that come along with that. So the kind of sweet spot for a lot of growers that we find ends up being about 32 to 40 foot in length. We can go longer, um, but 32 and 40 is a sweet spot. 
And then same thing with the shelving, that 12 to 14 foot tall ends up being the sweet spot in most places, um, most facilities, um, but we can definitely go taller. Um, there's a lot of capacity in um, all shelving has a lot of that capacity. It can go up to 23 feet, even taller and beyond that. But again, you have to take a really close and hard look at how you're gonna access everything, how effective it actually is going to be, how, what the quality of those plants are gonna be at those um, heights and spaces. Not necessarily due to the environment, but more so due to labor and access. And you have more forgiveness in the veg space, so typically that's where we see our higher densities. Uh, but you still need to think about the layout of the entire facility and supporting your flower room and the volume of plants that go into your flower space as well as you know, layout in regards to workflow and things of that nature. And so in the veg space, um, you definitely see your higher densities, um, you know, but it's, a, it, it's definitely not something to overlook as far as, as far as the volume of plants that are coming in and out of that space goes. James, can you walk us through this image a little bit um, and talk a little bit about air circulation and kind of what's happening uh, in this space? Sure. Um, so, tip, you know, uh, many of us in the indoor space came from single-tier cultivation where um, you have a big open ambient space between canopy and the ceiling in the room. You supply your HVAC, uh, you add some air circulation within the space and it's fairly easy with your HVAC design and, and some added circulation to create a homogenous environment. When you essentially you know, construct this grow cube in the space, you're throwing a ton of impediment in the space. You're putting layers across the entire room. So you're essentially putting what we used to put into, you know, we would build a three-story building in order to get the same amount of canopy or three rooms side by side in our previous applications. And so throwing all of that into one room creates a ton of impediment for the supply air coming from your HVAC and for your transpiration and heat load from your lights um, to get trapped in. So as the proximity shrinks from distance uh, from canopy to ceiling, you have to find a way to create consistent temperatures and humidities throughout the space. And so you can see there we have these, these uh, mixing chambers bolted to the outsides of the rack here with the inline fans. And what we're doing is we're pulling all of that ambient air, the more conditioned and uh, dehumidified air from, that, from this, we call it our primary mixing chamber, the outside of the rack right here, which we're strategically supplying all of our conditioned air to. And we're delivering that tier to tier in the space so that we can create consistency and de-stratify the microclimate um, throughout the canopy. If you're looking at the image on the left, the aisle that is in the front there that you see, we would refer to that as the main aisle. It's so generally when you walk into a room, the door that you open, you're in that main aisle. Now this is where all of your equipment, your people, your plants are going to come through. And so planning for the width of that main aisle is pretty critical. Um, on average, I guess, Dell, what are you seeing on designs? We unfortunately see people try to squeeze every bit of canopy into these rooms. So they'll get relatively tight. Normally there's going to be some um, requirements and access for whether it's ADA compliance or even OSHA compliance, but I'll try to squeeze up to sometimes 36 inches and that's just blatantly not enough space to be able to do all the work that you need to do, um, even store and have carts. Um, there's a lot of things that need to go on in that main aisle. Um, so our, again, always trying to target a sweet spot of 48 or even more um, space up front just yeah. to be able to even make turns with some types of scaffolding or man lifts or any other type of equipment you're going to have to try to bring into those rooms and access those plants with. Dell highlighted something that's interesting. We talk about this a lot. When we look at, sometimes we'll look at design plans and you can see what was designed by a grower and you can see what was designed by a CFO or an investor or an executive who's not as well connected with plants. And the big difference is, is the grower is really thinking about the processes that are going to happen, the equipment that's going to go in there. They mentioned uh, everyone has a different approach of how to access some of these higher levels. It started off a lot with ladders, then rolling platform ladders, scaffolding. We've seen um, drywall stilts. Um, we've seen a little bit of everything over the years. But that being said, if you are looking at scaffolding or you're looking at a rolling platform ladder, it's really important to look at the dimensions of that. Uh, can you even get it in the door? Because maybe your door isn't tall enough. Can you make the turn radiuses? So what's nice about a lot of this is when you're planning, you can basically get some masking tape out, get on the floor and say, here's how wide my aisle is. Here's what my mobile aisle looks like. And when I refer to a mobile aisle, I'm referring to the picture on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, that's a mobile aisle. We, we create that aisle when we need it. Um, plants usually are, are in a, what we call the resting or the home position 90% of the time. So if we have a 48-inch or an 80-inch mobile aisle, 
we can then spread that aisle and open it up wherever we want, whenever we want. Um, when no one's in the room, we'll generally take that, let's call it 40 to 8 to 80 inch mobile aisle, and we'll distribute and divide that by how many rows we have. And one of the reasons that we're doing that is we're leaving like a six, nine, or 12 inch gap between each row to help with transpiration, to help with airflow in the cube. Um, on mobile aisles, it's, it's really preference. You know, when it's, when it's grower dictated, they have a lot of preferences. So I wouldn't say that there's a right way to do that, but you do want to consider when you're designing something to make sure it has as much flexibility as possible. It's not uncommon for the person that was involved on the design side to not be there when the actual facility starts up. Uh, that's me. Um, and so that grower may say, I want this plant dens density spacing, um, but they're not thinking about what does the future look like? Maybe I want to have enough flexibility to modulate my plant densities. Um, to be successful in this space, we notice that you really have to have light feet. You can't get too fixed on a plan because things change. I mean, from when you started your facility, James, by the way, is one of the longest growing vertical farmers in the United States. Uh, he's on year five or six? Year five. And so he was actually Pip's first client. Um, so James, I mean, compared to where you were uh, when you got started to how you do things today, quite a bit different. Right. Yeah, quite a bit different um, for various reasons. And, you know, so much of that is dictated by uh, region and infrastructure and, and, and planning. You know, our, our space is essentially like a glorified research and development zone um, for which we plan on, you know, expanding our model in the future. So um, supplying air at different elevations to make that air more available for uh, our air circulation systems, um, workflow tactics, uh, veg support, understanding the rotations in the vertical space is important. So as we pivot to flower rooms a little bit, um, this is where vertical farming becomes a lot more challenging. Um, a lot of the folks that have had struggles converting over to vertical farming, it's in the flower room. Um, veg is a lot more forgiving in terms of transpiration rates. You can even look at less sophisticated HVAC if you're looking to save some money on your build out. Um, flower is where everything changes. So when they're sizing HVAC, they're sizing it based off of your max transpiration rate, which is usually in that week seven or so of flower. Um, and unfortunately, you're sizing equipment for a very short period of the flower cycle, but such a critical part of the flower cycle. And that's usually the difference between successful and low microbial or low mil mold and mildew crop or having something that has some compromises. Um, yeah, so the supply of your HVAC um, and, and the design and mechanical engineering behind your HVAC is very important in these spaces and it's one of the most overlooked aspects of it. And not necessarily that systems are under, you know, underpowered or, or not calculated correctly, but just this, the supply layout and design can be something that um, you want to make sure uh, you're, you're getting right from the very beginning. And in these spaces, you really kind of create a flow of air throughout the entire space and, and you need to make sure that you're supplying strategically to make that air available for whatever system that you're using for air circulation throughout the zone. A common mistake is to look at the racking and the transpiration rates as a later part of the process. It's really something that you want to get ahead of first. And so the reason I say that is, is your HVAC is going to be sized off of your total canopy and how much transpiration is happening in the room. You're not going to know what your total canopy is for sure until you have a racking layout. So and you really understand your plant densities. Um, that's what's driving this whole thing. So if you were to look at it from a systematic process and you're in the initial stages of design and maybe it's conceptual design or maybe you're working on something for a license um, and you haven't quite engaged an MEP team and you have a general kind of conceptual layout, um, we're really looking at that canopy size and those transpiration rates. And then that will drive your HVAC decisions um, and then lighting is based off of the racking layout because it's got a nice two to one ratio for every uh, four by eight section. There's generally two lights over it. So racking is something where if you can get ahead of it first and understand your canopy, it's really gonna drive a lot of decisions after the fact. Um, so some people look at it as, we haven't really figured out what we're doing for our, our canopy and they're making really critical decisions. And most likely two things end up happening. You either oversize your system and you're paying for too much HVAC, which has issues and challenges with it as well, but most importantly, you're most likely undersizing your HVAC. So every time we stack multiple tiers of plants, we're doubling or tripling the transpiration rates. Um, 
Can you highlight how much space we can create in a vertical farm from a single tier, double tier? Yeah, with a mobile racking system like this and multi-level system, at single level, just going from single level static to single level mobile, we can get up to 70% roughly utilization inside each one of these rooms. And then you can double that percentage every time that you uh, go up another tier. So a thousand square foot room yep. on a single tier is roughly 700 square feet of canopy. When we go to double tier, it's 1,400 square feet. You just made 400 square feet of canopy that didn't exist in your space. If we go to a triple tier, you're at 2,100. So we essentially focus on creating space that isn't being utilized in gardens. Um, Fog City Farms, we actually have more canopy space than we have building square footage. And, you know, where does, where does vertical farming not make sense? Well, if you've got, I don't know, a million square foot building and you've got hydroelectricity and the power is cheap and you can just expand single tier, well, you know, sure, vertical farming probably doesn't make sense. You know, maybe the demand isn't as good as it needs to be. Um, but, you know, when you look at um, major metropolitan areas and surrounding areas where real estate is really expensive, California is a prime example, um, you know, utilizing this space above your head that you're not utilizing makes a whole lot of financial sense. No, no. I also want to hop in and just talk about some of the practical, I guess, pitfalls that you can land on. As soon as you start to put this much space or this much canopy inside some of these rooms and utilize that full cubic space, there are some quirks and pitfalls that you can kind of fall into. Um, and I just want to make sure that if I can get anything across, I guess, so you want to design for what you're going to use this space on a day to day basis. And that's a little broad, but then it can tie into some really practical things like slabs and floors and how you're going to design those. One of the pitfalls we see quite a bit in these rooms is that it will try to slope the floors towards a trench or a drain location to try to assist with if you have a leak or when you're trying to clean the room. But at the end of the day, that's a process that only happens every so often, every couple of months when you're flipping a room. Um, and day to day, that can have some large impacts in the way the system and the equipment that you're going to put into this room is going to function over the, the lifespan. So as just a rule of thumb, definitely try to target a simple and flat floor. Um, and take into account all of your drainage solutions as well. The mobility has some quirks of its own. It offers a lot of advantages, but one of the things that you have to work around is going to be the drainage design and making sure that that mobility isn't going to create any issues for that. And that's where an in-floor trench that's down below or in the concrete slab that runs parallel with our tracks that you can see in both of those pictures there is going to be ideal. And then even the size of those rims can um, play into that as well, that the shorter lengths is going to make a little bit more sense to have that towards the back and out of the way. Um, once you get above 32 or about 40 feet, um, you're going to want to move that towards the center of the room. And that'll even play into the vertical space you're going to have in each one of those tiers. Um, at the end of the day, you have to evacuate that water and get it to the drains and the floor out of that room. And that's going to take up some vert vertical space. If you have a rigid PVC line down below the bottom level, um, you're going to have that stack, it, stack up of eighth inch per foot. Um, that can actually impact that bottom level and have to move that up, you know, two, three, six, we've even seen 12 or two feet. Uh, you might have to move that bottom level up, and that's directly impacting how much plant and quality plant you can grow in that space. I'd say that's another common mistake is people don't realize that you lose a couple inches here and there, and so you need to plan appropriately for those. You know, that could be your airflow solution. That could be your lighting that's going to absorb a couple inches. It could be how far you are, are off the ground. A lot of people want to put that first tray at their ankles as low as possible. Well, you have to work in this space. So when you start to work down here, ergonomically you have issues, things slow down a little bit, maybe you're not kind of going through as much product as possible. Um, on this side of things, this is where we do see a lot of specialized HVAC really coming into the space. It's made a lot of improvements over the last few years specifically. People are really starting to understand controlling temperature is not your issue. It's, it's controlling and removing humidity um, at, in the time frame uh, that you're looking to do. So as we shift into drying, you know, it's really no different for us. We're looking to maximize space everywhere possible. You're paying an extreme premium most likely at your indoor cultivation facility, and so every square foot and every cubic foot matters. And so we really focus on both. Um, in the picture here, you'll see a mobile system. So we create aisles when we need aisles. Um, this is a traditional in the right-hand picture, it looks like almost a whole plant or maybe broken down into maybe two or three parts, but um, they're generally drying and hanging in here 10 to 14 days, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 60% relative humidity. There's a lot of opinions out there. A lot of people have a lot of preferences on that, but that's kind of a common thing that we see quite a bit. Um, people will also, in this space, 
If you size your main aisle appropriately up front there, you can use this as a two-part space room. Um, so there's a part after this where you have to remove the buds from the actual stocks, commonly referred to as bucking. Um, I always look at value-adding touches and non-value-adding touches. And so an example of a non-value-adding touch, in my opinion, is every time that you have to touch the plant, put it into some kind of tote or barrel, and physically move it to another location. Um, every touch point after harvest is generally degrading something and not adding value to the end user. That being said, if you can eliminate the transfer and mobility of the plant, um, it can help you out a lot. So a common practice that I've seen that works out really well for people, instead of having maybe a four foot main aisle, they'll do a five or six foot main aisle in front of those handles that you see. And this allows them during, while they're taking the product down for drying, they'll set up kind of mobile bucking stations where they're stripping sometimes by hand, sometimes by machine, um, and they'll actually do the bucking process right there, which is nice because that room is already, I don't wanna call it dirty, but it's messy from the process. And so that's a messy process but now you just have one room to clean once. You didn't have to move your product. You didn't have to smash or put it into a tote. Um, so there's little things like that with the mobile systems. Um, I love the sanitation component of this. If you have fixed racking, unless you have some really incredible employees, it's highly unlikely that they're actually gonna clean and sanitize underneath some of these spaces. But with a mobile aisle, there's really no excuses because you're opening up that space, you're mopping, you're shop vacuuming, what your pressure washing, whatever your technique might be, you're fogging, you're foaming, um, and it allows you to really deep clean these spaces. We generally see that microbial issues, microbial issues are the highest actually in the drying and post-harvest space. Uh, so it's really important not just to have a clean and sterile space, but also to control your environment. Um, and a lot of that is driven by density and how much you're trying to cram into some of these spaces. Another one of the pitfalls is these drying rooms are oftentimes undersized and you're expecting to get very high density and a high volume of biomass in these rooms, but that can lead to a lot of issues in its own right. If you don't have the air circulation figured out for it, if you can't evacuate that kind of shock load of humidity when you first load these rooms, it can create a lot of issues. And we've seen some installations have to be adjusted after the fact to uh, reduce the density and reduce how many plants they can fit in that space to ensure everything gets successfully through that drying process. So really trying good. to mitigate that on the front end. S similar to your veg space, you know, you have to size your veg and your dry according to your flower room sizes and rotations. And so you want to make sure that you're not adding any wet material to this dry room and overlapping in your dry, you know, in your dry uh, processes because that's much more um, common than you think and it's something that us as legacy operators understood from, from the very beginning that you don't want to rehydrate these plants, right? And so building a, a you know, dry room the size of, of this room and thinking that you're going to just be able to bring in a fresh batch when you've got another you know, a group of plants that have only been drying in there for a week um, and everything's just going to be fine is, 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 not the, uh, is not the recipe for success. You'll definitely be uh, rehydrating those plants and extending your dry times and so making sure that you have uh, adequate sizing and, and layouts from a support perspective on both dry and veg. It's not uncommon for a really large flower room, and it really depends on their rotation. A lot of people have nine flower rooms. They flower in nine weeks. They're every weekly, they're, you know, they're, they're doing the same processes. Um, but if it's a really large flower room and you think it's going to take you two days to take the whole thing down, it's usually a good idea to consider two flower rooms, and you would basically split the load. So day one, I'm going to calculate for half the plants in my largest room. They're going to go into here. Day two, um, I'm going to put that other, other batch. Because what he's talking about is it's, a, it's like a re-moistening event. And the best, in layman's terms, the best way I can describe it is, is you're going to create spongy cannabis. And spongy is not a desirable characteristic for an end product. Um, but the common bottlenecks that we see and uh, we often rescue, which feels good because it's the difference between success and failure for people, um, the bottlenecks are in undersizing their veg, sometimes undersizing your mother room, but, in, but mo a lot undersizing your drying space. So it's not uncommon for someone to get in operations and kind of have that, oh shoot moment, I'm in trouble. And that's when you know, we can deploy some of these techniques to maximize all of their space. Phasing strategies, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, it's pretty common for most facilities to have some form of phasing. You know, they're learning new concepts. You've got to have some um, pretty strong confidence and experience in this space to fully build out a large facility in, in multi-tier if you've never done it before. 
So there's usually a phasing strategy. A lot of the phasing strategy can be dictated on state regulations, local municipalities. The picture that you're looking here is the exact same facility just two years later. So the picture on the left, single tier, this is in the state of Ohio. Ohio's regulations are, you can have, it for this license type here, they could have 25,000 square feet of room. Didn't matter how many tiers, actually I think there's an eight tier limit, which they wouldn't do, but um, it wasn't dictated by canopy or plant count. So in this case, they knew they were going to a, a second tier in the future, but they also knew that they were first to market in Ohio and that the demand wasn't gonna be quite there. So this isn't a product that stores forever and gets better over time like whiskey or wine. Um, it does have a shelf life and people are looking for peak freshness these days. Um, and so they knew that they didn't wanna sit on product that they didn't have a guaranteed outlet for. But they also were thinking about future proofing and they knew because they were first and they were building a demand that they wanted their phase two to happen as quickly as possible. And so the disadvantages here are really in your financial pocket. That's where it hits you. You're gonna have a higher capex with this strategy. So what they did is they oversized their racking, which is one option. The other option is we can uh, splice the racking. So in this case, Dell is at a 12 foot or 14 foot. I think, it, I think it's at least 14. 14, 14 for sure. Yeah. So in this case, you could have gone with a six or a seven foot to get started, then spliced another six or seven on top and saved a little bit of money. But they pre-planned all their electrical distribution they pre-planned their HVAC. They didn't commit as far as to actually buying the HVAC equipment, but they sized it appropriately, they sized their curbs, they built their waterproof membrane on their roof, they made roof hole penetrations one time, um, as every time you do that after the fact, you increase risk for, for problems in your grow. Um, so when they converted this facility over two years later, the advantages were is they didn't pull permits because they didn't have to. They used their in-house labor to install trays they popped up some lights. Um, you know, they had the HVAC company drop all that stuff and connect it, but they did this conversion in one week. The alternative is, is you're gonna have contractors and subcontractors entering your clean, sterile environment, and they're not always as um, mindful as you may be in your space. And so I think as a grower, you're trying to really eliminate people in your space as much as possible, and it would have been a long, drawn-out process. So, yeah, one week conversion from a single tier to a double tier with some future planning and pre-planning and spending a little bit more up front. you have any comments on, the, on other phasing strategies or I mean, anything you I'll wanna add to that? Touch in another variation of it is a lot of these facilities have multiple, multiple flower rooms and a high number of flower rooms and even multiple bedrooms. And you can also phase room by room as well. I think that a lot of people fall into the trap of wanting to build out the entire facility all in one go. And it is very viable to just build out a propagation room, bedroom, and a single flower room and get your feet wet, understand the process, learn the equipment, make sure that you're being successful, and then start to increase that load of adding additional rooms beyond that. And then sometimes it's just a practical and realistic uh, necessity based on availability of material and times and everything, especially over the last few years, um, that's become a lot more prominent. Environmental control, this is, uh, we've been talking a lot about HVAC in this vertical farming discussion. Um, on that note, while I have this feedback, I'm gonna turn it over to James, but yeah. this is the one where a lot of people get it wrong and they say vertical farming doesn't work. Um, right. your, your system is only gonna be as good as your HVAC, and on that note. Sure. Um, so there are multiple approaches towards, um, towards HVAC in this space, but ultimately, you know, in order to, to drop the moisture out of the air, you have to cool the air rapidly, get, you know, uh, the air to condense, and then supply it back to the room with some sort of reheat element, right? So you can't dump, you know, 45, 50 degree air directly on canopy without risking other issues like botrytis and powdery mildew and things of that nature. So regardless of what approach you're taking towards sizing your HVAC, you have to make sure that you're supplying it strategically to, to the vertical space. Because as you build this grow cube, you start to promote short cycling in the space, right? Where you're, you're supplying to the room and pulling it back into the HVAC system in order to hit that latent set point and it's, and it's not reachable by the bottom tiers and um, it's very, you know, at that point it can become difficult to, to regulate your temperature, which when it's supplied, you know, correctly can be the, the easier thing to hit, which is your temperature load and the latent load is what you need to make sure you're, you're calc correctly for. But um, all in all, you know, getting in on the front end and realizing what you're doing to move air through this space and how you're going to be supplying it strategically 
uh, to make that air readily available for the air circulation system is imperative. That's, I can't tell you how many spaces we've come into where, you know, uh, regardless of, of what they're doing to actually control the environment, they're supplying and returning on the opposite side of vertical air solutions and wondering why things are inconsistent throughout the space. Um, or, you know, they're supplying their dehumidification right next to their, their HVAC return air and, and wondering why they're, you know, the, the system isn't in balance. And so um, just because it's calced correctly doesn't mean that it's supplied correctly. So that's, that's a big lesson that I've learned from, uh, from looking at, at many of these grows. A nice thing to think about is, you know, your typical HVAC like the one that we're in right now, it may only be exchanging the air in this room a few times per hour if we're lucky. Um, but in these rooms, we're really targeting 20 to 30 full room air exchanges per hour. We're trying to homogenize that environment as much as possible. And depending on where your supply and returns are located, and this is critical, the elevations of those supply and returns, um, that can make a world of difference on the performance of your plants and, you know, mitigating disease. Everybody's favorite, genetics. Um, James said something to me last night that I really liked. Um, I, he said, in the beginning, I was really focusing on only growing certain types of cultivars in my vertical farming system. And, you know, three or, I don't know how, what, at what point later, but, you know, five years later, he said, now I can grow any cultivar on that system. You want to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of that came from the, uh, you know, years of experience we had before getting into this and what led to us being fairly successful in the vertical space is, was understanding the genetics and knowing what we were getting into and knowing that we needed to um, uh, throw plants in there uh, with stretch rates that were conducive to this plat to operating on this platform. So in the very beginning we ran uh, indica dominant um, you know uh, uh, plants that didn't stretch as much as many of the um, OGs and, and, and you know, sativa, sativa dominant, you know, plants that will, you know, grow into the lights and become, you know, uh, a canopy that you have to wrestle with throughout the entire, the entire round. But what we've learned through the years, and actually we learned it very quickly, was that if you just time it correctly, then, you know, you can create that laser level canopy with any cultivar, and you start looking at plant densities and timing in order to mitigate any issues that you run, run into there. So when you, you start your round, you've got, you know, certain plants that have a slower stretch rate that are, you know, starting the round at, at, at two feet above the pot, and you have other plants that are essentially coming in as clones, but by the end of the round, they're all finishing at the same elevation so that you can have consistent development throughout the space. It's not uncommon for a new grower who hasn't experienced their, is their brand new facility, they got new genetics, they got a new team, they got this new technology, and they go put these genetics in and they really don't know what they do. They have no idea if they stretch two times in flower. For those of you who don't know, plants seem to stretch quite a bit in the, once you initiate the flower cycle, but that stretch can be double the, the height of the plant, it can be triple the height of the plant. It's not uncommon to see someone who wasn't prepared, didn't understand their genetics, to actually have flowers growing through their lights into their air circulation. Um, and, you know, there's some hard lessons there. And when you build that much biomass, you're, you're really breaking that, that airflow that we're trying to, trying to uh, achieve. A trick that I've learned, and there's not many tricks in this space, but there are a few, um, is utilizing 30% shade cloth or something to that nature. So it's kind of similar to how you would lay out your trellis to support your plants. If you lay out a 30% shade cloth six to nine inches below where you want the top of your canopy to finish on the rack itself. And what you do is about anywhere between day seven or day 10 in flower, when it's actively stretching, you're laying this screen across. Um, now some of you are probably saying, hey, 30% shade cloth is gonna reduce my photons or my light concentration by 30%. Well, luckily we're in the day of the LED, so you're just gonna increase that and match the micromole level that you had going into it. So what's the point of the screen? The screen takes that dominant shoot, the apical mare stem, and it'll apply a gentle pressure to it. What happens in that pressure is the plant now says, well, I can't go up, and it'll actually redistribute hormones to secondary and tertiary shoots and kind of help level out that canopy and balance out that plant. I keep that screen on there, for, or I recommend people keeping the screen on there. It's really batch by batch, but anywhere between maybe 10 and 14 days. So maybe day 21 to 24, they're pulling that off. And when they pull it off, the plant has stopped stretching, and it's redistributed all that hormone in a much more even manner, almost like a, like a menorah on, on a plant. And when you take that screen off and remove it, you've got a laser level canopy to manage. Um, so that's a nice trick for people who are nervous about controlling certain varieties. 
or are just not quite sure how to manage their veg and really finish out a plant like you were talking about. The last one we have here, and then we're gonna jump into Q&A because I know that's usually like the best part, um, is really around ergonomics. So we talked about ladders and scaffolding. That's how we got started because those are the tools that we had available. Um, luckily, the guys over at Pip Horticulture were the first people to come up with a catwalk system that was pretty seamless and easy to put into the system. Um, I, I do believe in single tier cultivation, but I do have this discussion often. A lot of single tier growers say, well, I, you know, it doesn't ergonomically work. I don't want to be on a ladder. And the growers that I know on a single tier or that are doing the best, they're growing roughly a, anywhere from a five to seven foot tall plant, and they're doing that on a rolling bench usually. So the top of their canopy is actually about eight or nine feet. I'm a tall guy, but I'm not that tall. So what I do see is that most people that are growing single tier and doing it at a really high level, they're on step ladders. They're going up and down. They're having challenges working into their canopy. It's not ergonomically perfect. So um, the same challenges that some of the growers face in multi-tiered originally are the same challenges that they faced in, in, in the single tier. So what's nice about this catwalk platform system is you can bring it up to the perfect ergonomic level for the average height of your employees. You can make working on a second or third tier feel safe and secure. Um, Dell worked tire tirelessly on this design. Do you want to go through a couple benefits and features on it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the flexibility ends up being one of the biggest things that we were targeting. I mean, safety obviously is the largest priority for us. We have that part covered as best as we possibly can. Um, but flexibility and efficiency was the two primary things that we were looking at. Um, specifically being able to, like you had touched on, being able to adjust those heights to match ergonomics. Sometimes it's going to be placed, uh, based on the plants and either what stage of growth it is or what the cultivar is. Um, sometimes it's going to be even based around the height of your employees and who's going to be accessing and working on these rooms and working on these plants. So giving us a two-inch incremental adjustment um, allows you to set that at exactly the optimal height for you to be able to access everything. And then also the efficiency side is uh, a huge driving thing. I mean, I'll steal Michael's line a little bit to say that one of the largest um, expenses that you're going to have over the lifetime of this facility is going to be the labor expenses. So anything you can do to optimize and reduce that time spent on non-value-adding processes like setting up a catwalk system or rolling out a rolling scaffolding is going to be a huge benefit to you. And we ended up spending a lot of time trying to make sure that a single person can set up this system from the front of the system in a very, very short period of time relative to some of the other options and solutions out there. Um, so it's not necessarily enough just to have a solution and have an option with a ladder, step ladder, rolling scaffolding. You really need to have something that's going to be optimized and efficient over the long run. Your labor is your biggest operating expense. It's also your biggest liability. You guys are going to spend millions of dollars building facilities, and if someone gets hurt, all that can be for nothing. So we always want to keep people safe first and foremost. We can always grow more plants, uh, and then everything else is really centered around the plants. So people that implement these systems, we see that morale picks up, culture can pick up in these facilities, which is a big issue because people don't really know what they're signing up for when they get into plant manufacturing is really what this is. It's like small factory work, and a lot of people aren't used to doing something 1,000 or 10,000 times a day. So if you can shave two seconds off and make it safer, those seconds in, in cannabis really do equate to dollars. Um, on that note, let's, let's jump into Q&A. I think I got my last slide here. Yeah, we got about eight minutes, so I'll oh, eight come minutes, around yeah. and walk with the microphone. Hello, um, I have two questions. Um, um, in crop steering, you feed two or three minutes at a time these events. Um, the water pressure sometimes doesn't reach the end of the row, and I also notice sometimes the top tier dries out first. How do you, how do you, uh, especially in rockwool too, sometimes in soil it's okay, but in rockwool they really dry out. Uh, how do you take care of that at the end of the row so they don't suffer? Yeah, that sounds like a, an engineering issue. Um, I'd probably maybe have a discussion with my engineer and um, see where we maybe made mistakes on undersizing pipes um, mm -hmm. or undersizing uh, pumps. Um, I mean, they have that water pressure thing, but sometimes you're only feeding for one minute, so by the time that water gets to the end of the row, it, get, it doesn't get anything, you know? Well, you could break it up into smaller zones, because it's all about pressure regulation, you know, and, and in the vertical space, you have to think about the size of each zone, mm -hmm. the capacity for your pump, which dictates your solenoid valves and your loops, and then also now elevation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, there's multiple ways to look at 
going at that based on the configuration and the length of your, of your rows. Okay. And my second question was, um, um, usually you, you have them in there um, for maybe 21 days, three rooms at a time. Um, how do you, because in flower room you could flush the lines with you know, an acid or a zero tall. How do you flush those lines in vertical veg? That's, you know, because you have different stages. Um, how do you the, do that? The irrigation lines? Yeah, you flush the irrigation lines. How do you, you know, because in a flower room, do you flush them with zero tall yeah. or something after every harvest? How would you, it's really hard when you have three stages, three zones. You, so that's, that's a, you know, that plays into the rotation, you know, talk and understanding your rotations and keeping each zone isolated to support your flowering space. So you should empty out an entire irrigation zone to supply your flower space, and then you can flush that zone independently. H2O2, zero tall, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a quick question in relation to the return air supply. Is there, um, if you have, uh, is there like a uh, gold standard where that should be set in your return, it, at a level, at what level, above the ground? Um, should it be multiple? Should it be just at, say, the level of the second, if there's a two-tier system, uh, rack system? Is there a standard, or is it all based on airflow modeling? Um, how do you determine what's the, the most uh, uh, proper uh, placement of that return air vent? It depends on elevation of your, your elevations. Um, we do like the multi-elevation supply and returns when available. We're trying to get that supplier as close to your in-rack circulation system as possible and kind of almost carry it across or through the canopy. Generally, a lot of it, it's preference, but if you have the ability to have access to airflow modeling, we always like making data-driven decisions. So that's going to be your best bet. But as a rule of thumb, we see people even making, um, a lot of people are using IMP or insulated metal panels for their walls. They'll actually do a secondary wall on the back side of the room and create the whole back wall as a, as a lung um, or a channel, and they'll set different return air uh, grills at different elevations based off of where plant canopy really sits. There's a lot of paths that'll get you there too, right? There's not a, I wouldn't say there's a gold standard right now. I think we're evolving quickly of trying to identify what that is. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Chuck Miller with Ingenix Energy. Um, we are a, a company that builds multi-tier grows. We built about 650,000 square feet for the larger MSOs. And one of the things that has really been coming an issue is the, the energy intensity and the thermal requirements for these multi-tier facilities. Um, we've been pushing now towards uh, doing combined heat and power where we're generating power on site and recovering thermal energy. Are you guys familiar with that? Do you, have you used that? Um, and do you have any kind of uh, a guidance on energy and thermal energy consumption within these multi-tier grow facilities? Were you referencing like co-generation or tri-generation? Co-gen and tri-gen, okay. yes. Got it. Um, a lot of people need to think about where they're building their building. So, you know, they're like, oh, I got the perfect building. And then my first question is, is how much power do you have? And that's where they're like, Oh, I got enough, you know, but people really do underestimate the amount of power that it's going to take and they find themselves in these situations where they're looking at uh, temporary power, which especially in California ends up being multi-year power if you're waiting for some of the local municipalities to approve stuff. Um, but also the scale, you know, and, and I, we see in some of these other, in these newer markets, uh, the cogen technology is a little bit more prevalent because the scale can be much larger whereas in California, there are plenty of very large-scale grows, but um, not as much power available, and, and, and there's just more operators in general, so the scale can typically be smaller on average. But um, It almost goes back to planning again. It's like you, you had a plan, but you didn't have enough power to execute your plan, but you elected for this space, and you took a harder road, and now you have to get creative on what's the most efficient way to bring in power. Do I have natural gas around that cogen? Are these, am I running off of diesel? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there that has some hairs on it. And again, it goes back to that upfront planning. You know, what seems like the best building for you, it needs to check a lot of significant boxes. Because if one of those critical boxes isn't checked, you're looking at some pretty long delays to revenue. Um, and that can be the difference between success and failure or 
dilution of what you think you own. One final question here. Thanks, guys. This is a great presentation. Uh, I'm curious for cultivators and groups that are getting into multi-tier for the first time, what realistic expectations do you guys talk about and recommend around first run, second run? What kind of KPIs and you know performance metrics you know should the cultivation team kind of be held to as they're getting to know this new form of growing? Are you referencing uh, like yield metrics? Yeah, maybe yield metrics or how to share it. You know how to how to set realistic expectations with the financial team to make sure that there's not missed expectations? It's a great question. Um, a lot of stuff looks really good on paper. Um, I would recommend finding someone that's actually doing the thing that you're attempting to do. Um, you know, if you look at a company like PIP, they have got thousands of installations. They're happy to connect you with growers like James. I call him Farm One because he was the first guy. Um, but I would, I would get very connected with people that are doing the thing that you want to do because most likely if you're in the planning stage with your investors and things like that, you're making a lot of assumptions. You may be working with a consultant. They may be a great consultant. They may be a, a phony. There's a little bit of both in this industry you'll find. Um, so really finding someone who's really doing the thing and looking at their metrics and getting that data from someone that's doing it versus an assumption would be my best um, advice for someone trying to enter the space. Do you have any? I think that's a great recommendation. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, it, it all depends on what your goals are. You know, in, in, in California, we can't grow any of these super high yielding strains because they don't sell in the market. So, so our you know, grams per square foot is gonna be different than someone in, in Ohio who can grow you know, Blue Dream um, you know, all day long and, and yield essentially almost twice as much per square foot as we would with some of our more highly desirable you know, OG Kush strains, for instance. So, so it's really kind of a regional thing, and, you're, and whoever's helping you guide that ship should understand what is relevant in that space. It's a great comment. Depending on the state, if you're in a new state and everyone's just excited that cannabis is finally here, guess what? They're going to buy whatever you grow. So you might want to be focusing on that high yield and biomass, but in a developed, mature state, California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, now Michigan, and others, the, the evolving consumer... They know better now. They have preferences. They have tastes. They will pay more for certain premiums, but that puts the cultivators um, in a different position where they may have to focus more on quality and less on quantity. Um, but new emerging states, I hate to say it because I'm a quality guy, but you might want to just grow as much as possible because it doesn't matter what you call it, what it looks like. It's going to sell at least pretty quickly in that first year or two, but you better be changing your model and preparing for quality to win the race in the end. I mean, I can leave it with this. In, uh, in our you know, glorified R&D space, you know, we've had yields that are in the, you know, 80 pounds um, per round and, and up to 135 pounds per round off of, off of an 800 square foot room. So very easy metrics for you to look at, but, um, you know, all, that's, you, that's all just based off of genetics. Okay, if everyone uh, gives one more uh, round of applause to Michael, James, and Dell up here. Thank you guys, thank you very much.